Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Now, over the last two months, I have been cruising all around the Mediterranean with a number of cruise lines on a number of different ships. Now, one thing that's been really clear to me is that there's a number of things that regardless of what cruise line you come to Europe with, you absolutely need to think about the same things. Now, in this video, I am going to give you my top 10 tips for things that you should think about if you're planning a cruise around Europe because yeah, I hadn't realized all of these until this year and some of them have really impacted my experience. So look, if you find this video useful and if you enjoy it, it would be amazing if you would give it a thumbs up, which you can do just beneath the video. And also if you'd like to come along on my journey, I'm living on cruise ships as a passenger for most of 2023. So absolutely feel free, hit subscribe, which you can do directly underneath the video and also pop down in the comments and say, Hello, that would be brilliant. But look, for now, let's get started on the top 10. Tip number one for me is really, really important and it's all about weather. Now, if you've been following my journey, I entered Europe after doing a transit of the Suez Canal from the Middle East. Now, what that meant for me is that in the Middle East, the weather was really, really hot. And by the time I got into Europe, which was about early April time, it was beginning to warm up, but it was much, much colder than what I'd seen in the Emirates. Now, what that meant was that I needed to have waterproofs, I needed to have jumpers, I needed to have, in some cases, a set of gloves, which, fine, seven weeks down the line, I don't need them anymore, thankfully. But the point that's really important about weather in the Med is that it's way more unpredictable here than what it is in some other parts of the world. Now, from my previous Caribbean cruises, I know that around that same time of year, it's much, much warmer there. And generally speaking, it can be a much more predictable level of heat. What I've found in the Med is that one day you can wake up and it can be 23, 24 degrees Celsius, blazing sunshine, and you just need shorts and a t-shirt. And 24 hours later, it can be pouring with rain, it can be cold, and yeah, you need to absolutely be prepared for it. Now, the number of people that I've met on ships who remain on the ship all day when they're docked in some of these Italian ports because it's raining and they don't want to get wet because they don't have a poncho or they don't have a waterproof or they don't have an umbrella. For the sake of a couple of grams in your suitcase, chuck in a poncho, throw a collapsible umbrella in to make sure that when you dock in these cities, you can head off the ship and explore. Now, tip number two for me is all about money. And one thing that struck me over the last, what, 10 weeks since I moved on to these cruise ships is that it's quite difficult at times when you're juggling lots of different currencies. So when I started in Dubai, you're using the dirham. When you work your way around towards the Suez Canal, you do encounter two or three different currencies all the way around there, which means that you arrive in port and you constantly think, ah, I wonder what currency we need to spend here. I don't have any cash. Will my travel card give me a good exchange rate? And then generally trying to work out how expensive things are when you go around a town or a city. Now, in the majority of European ports, that's actually not a huge problem because the majority of ports here all use the euro. Now, what that means is that when you're in Italy, you'll be using the same currency as when you're in Spain, as when you're in France, as when you're in a number of other countries all around the Med. Now, that, to be honest, simplifies the process because once you know the exchange rate from British pound to euro, or US dollar to euro, or Australian dollar to euro, or whatever currency you're used to dealing with, you can get a really, really clear picture in your mind, whenever you dock and wherever you dock, how much you're spending on things. So yeah, definitely a real asset is that the majority of European ports will all use the same currency. Now tip number three is looking at history. Now history is a really important one because those of you who maybe haven't been to Europe before, some of the history that this continent has is absolutely remarkable and it goes so far back. Now, what I've realised over the last few weeks in particular is that when you visit some ports, it's actually really beneficial to do a little bit of reading before. Otherwise, you're on the risk of arriving and being a little bit overwhelmed with information. Additionally, if you pre-read some information before you arrive, you can learn a bit more about would you like to go and visit that site? Would you like to go and visit that site? Because in some cases, or the majority of cases, if you're spending one day in port on that cruise, you don't have time to see it all. I'll give you an example. Most people, when they dock in Naples, will head over and check out Pompeii. 
And when you say to them, oh, have you thought about Herculaneum, which is another similar site, they say, oh, I actually didn't realise that was there. Now, when you do a little bit more research, you actually begin to discover that Herculaneum is actually better restored than Pompeii, but Pompeii has got the international appeal and it's got the name, so quite a lot of people miss out on going to Herculaneum because they've only ever heard of Pompeii. So make sure, wherever you're going, whether it's the UK, whether it's elsewhere in Europe, jump online, have a quick look at the history of that area before you go. Now, the next one, tip number four for me, is looking at docking in ports. Now, I always think it's important that before you go a cruise, or as soon as you get onto that ship, make sure you know if your ports that you're calling at are what I would call docking ports or tender ports. Now, what I mean by that is if you're stopping at a docking port, there probably is a more, <laughs> a more official name for that, but if you're stopping at a docking port, that basically means that the ship will, similar to what we've done today here in Civitavecchia, the ship will pull alongside the dock and they will drop the gangway or they'll connect the air bridge and then you can walk ashore. Now, the flip of that is if you visit a tender port, which is essentially where for a number of reasons they can't dock the ship. Now, you'll sometimes find that could be due to the fact that the island you're visiting maybe doesn't have docking facilities, so it's maybe not established enough to have a dock coming out from the pier. You may also find that the area you're docking in has got coral, so for that reason you can't take a cruise ship all the way in because you'd run the risk of damaging the coral. Now, instead of taking the ship in to drop the gangway, what they'll often then do is open up a door in the side of the ship and they'll service the ship with much smaller boats to take you ashore. Sometimes, in the more established ports, that will mean that a tender company will bring their own small boats up to the ship to offload the passengers into to take them to the island. But in some other places, what can actually happen is that the ship will then lower its lifeboats into the water to then use the lifeboats to go back and forth from the ship, essentially operating as a shuttle service. Now I hear you ask, why is that important? Because surely it doesn't matter because I'm on the cruise so I can go ashore whenever. Now this, I think, is one of the most common mistakes that people make on a cruise because if you are visiting a tender port, you absolutely need to make sure you understand the process for getting off that ship and you also need to understand that it's going to take a lot longer, usually, than what it will if the ship is connected to land via a bridge. Now, some cruise lines will operate a process where you book on to book your tender time, in which case, you know that if you go down to deck whatever to get off the ship at 9am, that's the boat that you're booked onto, so that's fine. Other cruise lines operate a first-come, first, a first-come, first-served policy where you just go down and join the queue, and you kind of hope, I guess, that when you go downstairs, the queue isn't too long. So definitely make sure that if you're docking at a tender port, you know the process, you know how to get off, and you've factored that into your day. So next week, I'm heading over to Israel to visit the Greek islands with Royal Caribbean, and on, those, on that itinerary, the majority of my ports are actually tender ports, so the first thing I will be doing when I get onto that ship is, as weird as it sounds, understanding how to get off, because if I don't, I'll waste a lot of time on the first couple of tender ports figuring out how to go ashore. So yeah, really, really important. Now, tip number five is actually continuing on the point of docking. Now, in some parts of the world, you pretty reliably will dock in the centre, and in others, you pretty reliably will dock quite far out. Now, Europe is a really, really interesting part of the world to cruise in because some of those ports, you'll be right in the middle of the city. For example, if you dock in Genoa, if you dock in Barcelona, if you dock in Naples, probably more Genoa and Naples rather than Barcelona, but if you dock in a number of these cities, you'll be on the ship looking out at the city skyline and you almost feel as though you could touch people's apartment buildings outside the ship. Now, to flip that on its head, some other ports that you'll visit, you'll be really quite far away from the kind of main buzz of life. So, the example I would give, outside my window at the moment, which I appreciate you're looking the other way, so you might be able to see a little in the mirror, the port we're at today is Civitavecchia, which is the port that's local to Rome. Now, for me to get to Rome today, 
I had to get up really early and take a 45 minute train into the city. The ship is actually about a 30 minute journey away from the train station because you have to take a shuttle bus, then you walk. So it's very, very different to the experience that we had in Naples yesterday, which to be honest, the Naples port is remarkable because you go, you can have a coffee at the back of the ship and you are looking out over the entire city and it takes you all of three minutes to walk over to the main city centre. So the reason why I think this is one of my top tips is that you can really change the type of day you have by understanding how much time you have to commute to where you're going. So for example, if I naively thought that this ship today would dock in Rome, bad example I know because Rome isn't on the coast, but if I thought this ship was going to get into Rome and I had planned to visit the Vatican, the Colosseum, the Pantheon and a whole number of other attractions, I'd have been really disappointed because I would have realised that I've instantly lost a number of hours at the start of my day to actually get into the city. So always make sure you know if your ship is going to be docking in the city centre or a little bit further out. Okay, tip number six. So we're now more than halfway there. What I'd like to talk to you about now is unfortunately tourist scams. Now, one thing that is so clear in some European cities is that, oh, unfortunately, some people will take advantage of tourists. And if you look at some cities that will remain nameless for now, but there are warnings everywhere about pickpockets. You will see going down the street that people will be trying to give you a bracelet. If that bracelet goes on your wrist and it gets connected, you're going to try and disconnect it when they ask you for five euros. While you're trying to disconnect it, your hand is no longer on your iPhone in your pocket and you're not thinking about your wallet on the other side. So that's one example. We also saw last week where there was a person dressed as a clown in Barcelona. They would make a balloon animal for the child. The child gets really excited because they've now got a balloon animal. And then the clown turns to the parents and says, OK, five, five euros. And before you know it, this ends up with an angry clown because the parents usually say no. The balloon animal comes back, the child's crying, and before you know it, you've paid the clown to get the balloon animal back to stop the child from crying. So, yeah, a couple of examples where, yeah, my general rule of thumb with tourist scams is that if it's too good to be true, unfortunately, it probably is. And always just be really, really sure that before you accept that free gift, for example, a rose at the dinner table or a bracelet walking down the street, just be really clear. A, do you actually want it? And B, is it real? Because if it's too good to be true, it probably is. If you take one thing away from this video and it's that sentence, then yeah, <laughs> hopefully that will be of use. Now, sticking on the same theme of tourist scams, I don't really think this is a scam as such, but it's just a point to be really aware of because in Europe, I have been, yeah, really struck by it over the last few weeks. Now, it's everybody's dream, I know it's everybody's dream, in Italy, to have pasta and a glass of wine looking at the Colosseum. I know, I get it. It's an absolute dream to have an Italian glass of wine looking at the Tower of Pisa. It's another dream to have, I don't know, a glass of champagne looking up at the Eiffel Tower. Totally get it, we'll never take that away from you. The point I would make is that always remember that if you can see a main attraction from your dinner table, you're gonna have to pay for that nine times out of 10. What I would always say from a tip point of view is go and check out that main attraction and walk two streets back because I can almost guarantee you the price that you will pay two streets back will be significantly less than sitting directly in front of the Colosseum. Yes, you're not going to get the Colosseum in your Instagram photos, but you'll probably get a nicer dinner better service and you'll pay less money for it. So always remember, if you can see the attraction, be prepared to cough up. Another really big example of that is in Venice, where if you go to the main square in Venice, you better be prepared to pay a really healthy price for your coffee. On the flip of that, take a couple of streets back, your coffee, fine in Venice, is never going to be a bargain, but you'll pay a quarter anyway of what you would pay per coffee to sit in that, that kind of main square. Okay, next one, number seven, is looking at the business that you'll experience in some of these ports. 
Now, some of the ports that you'll visit in the Med on a typical Eastern or Western Med itinerary will have a lot of people as a result of a number of ships. Now, today, for example, we're here in Civitavecchia. We're joined at the back by a Symphony of the Seas from Royal Caribbean, and we're joined directly opposite by Norwegian Epic. Now, both of those ships, particularly Symphony, are really, really big ships. Now, I'm on Costa Toscana, and she is also a big ship that can carry upwards of three, four, five thousand passengers at one time. Now, what that means is that when you get off of the ship, Things are going to be in pretty high demand out there. For example, taxis. For example, shuttle buses. For example, tables in local cafes and local restaurants. Now, the tip that I would give here is if you are planning to go somewhere, if you're planning to do something and you're relying on things out there being quiet to make sure you can get a taxi quickly or to make sure that you can get a table at your favourite restaurant, you might want to think about booking things because in some ports... I already know, I dock in Barcelona in three days' time and I've already looked at the schedule on there and we've got five cruise ships in at the same time. So Barcelona port in a few days is going to be next level busy. So just always, always bear that in mind. Now, sticking on the subject of ports, I think the penultimate, well, point eight, I think this is point eight, my eighth tip is the embarkation on European cruises can quite often happen at a number of points during your seven night cruise. So when I had previously cruised over in the US as an example, everybody got on on day one and everybody left on day seven or day eight, unless you were staying for a back-to-back -back cruise. Now in Europe that's slightly different where some cruise lines will operate three night cruises, they'll operate four night cruises or they'll operate seven night cruises that you can embark or disembark at any port. So if I give you the example of the ship that I'm on right now, which is Costa Toscana, the majority of Costa's itineraries, you can get on in Barcelona, you can get on in Marseille, you can get on in Savona, you can get on in Civitavecchia, all the way through the week. So every single port day on this cruise, it's somebody's first day, and it's also somebody's last day. Now, other companies that also do that are MSC, which is another huge European cruise line. Now, why is this a top tip for you guys? Now, the reason for this is that, yeah, fine, from a flexibility point of view, it's great. So I know that if I can only get off work Saturday to Saturday, that's fine. Because if I pick a Costa or an MSC ship, I'll be able to embark somewhere on the Saturday or somewhere on the Sunday or whatever day suits me personally. But the other thing that you need to think about with this is where do you actually want to embark that cruise ship? So to give you the example, when I, get off, when I got off my first ship this year, which was MSC World Europa, I finished in Marseille in France. Now, I looked at my schedule and I knew that I wanted or I needed to get to Barcelona in a few weeks' time. So I actually decided that rather than getting on the next ship in Marseille, which is where I docked, I chose to utilise the fact that I can get on and off anywhere by heading over to Barcelona and joining a ship there. Now, the, the reason why I chose Barcelona was, yes, to get me onto the ship schedule that I wanted to be on, but also just due to the fact that I love Barcelona as a city. It's one of my favourite cities in the whole of Europe. I know the hotels, I know the areas, I know good restaurants that I want to go to. So for that reason, I would always choose to embark a ship in Barcelona if I'm going on a Mediterranean cruise. Now the flip of that is that you could choose to embark here in Civitavecchia. So Symphony of the Seas this summer actually operates with two embarkation points. So they don't operate with getting on and off everywhere, but you can embark in Barcelona or you can embark in Rome. So just always think when you see the price pulling through for Barcelona, okay, that's fine but could I get on anywhere else that might better suit my flights, that might better suit my hotel requirements, and generally, I might prefer that as a city. So especially if you're coming long haul, Europe's a big, big trip for you, so don't let one single embarkation point limit your enjoyment of the cities before or after your cruise. Now on the point of cities before and after your cruise, my ninth point, so now my penultimate point, is that to be honest, if you're coming all this way and you've got time, Europe is really, really easy to connect across. 
Now my tip here is that while you're here, why don't you think about taking in other European cities? So Europe actually, parts of Europe, depending on where you are, can feel pretty small at times. And if you were to fly from Barcelona up to London, that only takes a few hours. Generally speaking, you can do it with a low cost carrier and it won't cost you a huge amount of money. Now, alternative to that, you could get to Barcelona, you could hire a car and you could head down and check out the French coast. You could even, if you were really ambitious, drive around and take in a little bit of Portugal. So my big, advi my big bit of advice here, sorry, is that while you're in Europe, why not look at cashing in on physically being here by taking in as much of our continent as you possibly can? Because if you check out two, three, four cities, you're going to experience such different cultures in every single one of them. Now, speaking of culture, this brings me on to my final point, And this has caught me out a few times over the last two months. So make sure, make sure that you think about this one. And it's a topic of siestas. Now, multiple countries across a Mediterranean cruise itinerary will operate with a siesta as a really, really integral part of their day. Now, what that means is that in the middle of the afternoon, life will go quiet and life will shut down for a few hours. Now, what that allows these local people to do is to go back in the afternoon and spend time with their family. So that means that in a lot of countries, for example, Italy, for example, Spain, life will cease early afternoon. So you quite often find that shops will be open from nine o'clock in the morning until lunchtime, which is usually around 12.30, 1 p.m. Now, at that point, things will close and they will reopen again usually about 4 p.m., but depending on where you are, it can massively fluctuate. It's always best to check out the opening hours of any shop when you arrive in that city, especially if you're wanting to come back to it at some point. Now, generally speaking, I see that places reopen at four o'clock. So my tip here is that if you're planning to go out and you're planning to go for a shopping day, for example, especially if you're in the smaller towns or the smaller cities, make sure you check out what time they close and also what time they reopen. So you may want to head off the ship early, head to the shops, break for lunch yourself, and then head back out when you know that they're gonna reopen. Now, the good news here is that although things like shops will close, generally speaking, tourist attractions should or usually will remain open, and bars and restaurants and cafes will also usually remain open. Now, the reason for that is that when these local people spend family time, they quite often do that by catching up in a restaurant or by catching up in a cafe with their family. Now, that means that actually, if you're clever with it, you can just time that during siesta, you can either head back to the ship or you can plan to put a couple of euros into the local economy by stopping over for coffee and a cake, which, to be honest, I can't think of a better reason to do that. So, yeah. Hopefully you found this video useful. That's my top 10 tips for if you are planning to cruise to the Mediterranean, which I really hope that you are at some point. Now, if you haven't found my channel before, then for the rest of this year, I am going to be spending it living on a number of cruise ships from a number of cruise lines, and I would love you to come along with me as well. So as I said earlier, if you'd like to do that, you absolutely would be more than welcome to by clicking subscribe directly underneath and if you do, it'd be brilliant to say hello. So please feel free to leave a comment. But yeah, let me know, have I missed any tips or is there anything else that you think, ah, people need to know this? If there is, drop a comment and let me know. But for now, I'm gonna head back out into the sunshine here in Rome and enjoy a bit of a view on the top deck. But for now, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch up with you all soon. Great, cheers guys, bye.